important way. Um, those of you that have studied economics will probably have come across the idea that money has different functions. Um, typically, th those, those two that, that come out are uh, a medium of exchange, a way of um, exchanging things with each other, and a store of value, a way of holding on to um, future purchasing power. Um, there is another function which is less well known, which is unit of account. Now, the uh, sort of orthodox classical and then neoclassical economic schools of thought have concentrated very much on this medium of exchange function uh, and neglected the, the other two functions significantly. And there's an important kind of history here, a story um, about the nature of money that, that sort of comes out uh, and justifies uh, orthodox economic thinking in this area, which is essentially that money emerged naturally over a course of time to enable us to move beyond barter exchange, to get beyond the, the need for what I have and what you have to be exactly the right things um, beyond the double coincidence of wants. So it's quite an inefficient um, way, you know, you're hanging around for the, for the right good, that I'll give you this good if, if you have exactly what I want. Um, and <coughs> certain kinds of commodities, typically those that are highly portable, that have intrinsic value, um, emerge naturally and are used, ra rather than being commodities in themselves, they're used as exchange commodities to enable us to exchange things. Um, and that's the sort of classic story about the emergence of money. And of course the, the implication of that is that money is itself <coughs> is largely a sort of neutral commodity that, that lies over the real economy, which is, which is about exchange, which is about labour, which is about land. And the classi classical economists um, promoted this idea very strongly. Uh, money is simply the oil that wheels everything else in the, in the economy. In fact, history shows us, and, uh, and economic anthropologists, historians, uh, and heterodox economists, actually, have done a lot of research to show that actually many thousands of years before the invention of coins and, and gold and these commodities that are sort of optimised for the uses of, of medium of exchange, there were actually um, accounting, accounting was taking place, records of debt and credit were taking place. Um, and this is a cruciform block here, the top left, um, from the Bab Babylonian times. So 4,000 years ago, thousands of years bef before gold coins, um, people were making records, deposits with interest uh, of credit and debt. And the point I want to make here is to say, if money is essentially a relationship of credit and debt, um, then money is also socially and politically constructed because you have debtors and you have creditors. Okay? It's not this neutral commodity um, and the, the people who determine what money actually is are those people who determine the unit of account that is used to keep those records of credit and debt. And historically, we've seen that the organisation that tends to do this is the most powerful organisation, whether it's you know, the chief of tribes, whether it's palaces, and, and more recently, the state essentially has determined what that unit of account that we keep those records of credit and debt in actually is. The reason we use sterling rather than any other piece of paper um, is essentially because we can make our most routine payments with it, which are taxes. Okay, that's, why, that's the main reason there is demand for this sort of unit of account over any other kind of, of unit of account. So the point there is that the state plays an absolutely fundamental role in determining the, the moneyness of um, any particular item. And, and what I'm trying to explain with this slide really is that the, the medium through which we transact with each other uh, changes through time from these cruciform blocks thousands of years ago through to coins, through to IOU, paper notes essentially, through to modern money uh, in the form of credit cards um, and, and essentially digital money. It changes over time. But the, the, the relationship between the creditor and the debtor uh, remains, and that unit of account remains the same. So the commodity theory of money um, is much less significant in that sense. What we've seen over the last 
uh, 30, 40 years, is essentially what Richard was talking about yesterday, the privatisation of the money supply uh, by virtue of a number of different factors. And, you know, it's not some big conspiracy, this. It's the conflation of developments in electronic technology and deregulation of the banking system. So the red line shows essentially public money, you might call it, notes and coins plus central bank reserves <coughs> created by the, the Bank of England, sort of public money. And you can see that up to um, the, the late 60s, uh, the, the amount of commercially uh, bank-created money in notes and coins was, was quite similar. And then since then, um, commercial bank money has kind of exploded exponentially away um, to the point where 97% of money is now essentially created uh, by banks. Um, so we've had this move away from uh, what we, a lot of us think of as, as money, notes and coins, uh, towards this digital private bank money. Now, that brings us to the question of what banks actually do and how they, they create money. And Richard talked about these yesterday, but I just want to go into it in a bit more detail because it's really important to, um, to understand